It's a great pleasure to chair and introduce our second panel this morning, which will be on peace and justice. Uh, my name is Richard English. I'm director of the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice at Queen's University Belfast. And on behalf of everyone at the Mitchell Institute, we're absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you to Bonnie and Emma and Hera and colleagues at Yale for hosting us. I think already we've seen what a fantastic venture this has been in terms of the wisdom and insights that there have been this morning. Uh, Sergio mentioned his 26 points. In introducing this, I've only got 54 that I'll go through before we actually start, but um, I'm going to introduce our three distinguished panelists and then we'll have a chance to hear from them. And after the privilege of hearing them, we're gonna to move to questions from you and discussion. Eduardo Cifuentes is president of the Colombian Special Jurisdiction for Peace. He previously served as director of the Human Rights Division of UNESCO between 2003 and 2005, and has since 2013 served as a member of the National Group of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. Dr. Cifuentes is also an associate professor at the Universidad de Los Andes, and he's going to speak to us first after I've introduced the fellow panelists. Our other two panelists are Martin Flaherty, who's Leitner Family Professor of Law and founding co-director of the Leitner Center for International Law and Justice at Fordham Law School. He's also a visiting professor at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and at Columbia University School of Law. Martin has led or participated in human rights missions around the world in Northern Ireland, in Turkey, in Hong Kong, in Mexico, in Malaysia, <laughs> in Kenya, Romania, and China. Our third distinguished panelist is Elizabeth Wood, the Franklin Muzzy Crosby Professor of the Human Environment and Professor of Political Science here at Yale, Political Science International and Area Studies here at Yale University. Professor Wood is the author of Forging Democracy from Below, Insurgent Transitions in South Africa and El Salvador, and Insurgent Collective Action and Civil War in El Salvador. Professor Wood teaches courses on comparative politics, on political violence, social movements, and community organizing, on agrarian studies and qualitative research methods. It's a real honor to have all three of our distinguished panelists with us for this panel on peace and justice. And now a real privilege for me to hand over to our speaker, Eduardo Cifuentes. Eduardo. Good morning. Thank you, firstly, for the invitation. Um, it's for me uh, an honor to be here with you. I have prepared some written notes that I will share with you. I have to say that uh, after this excellent presentation of Sergio Jaramillo, our brilliant negotiator of peace, now a role as JEP, the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, is to implement that accord. So I reside in the day after of the peace accord. Allow me to give first some elements about the restorative and, dialog and dialogical model of the special jurisdiction for peace. The peace process with the FARC is the most recent transitional justice process in Colombia. The final peace agreement created a complex investigation system that is based on like the other processes on the centrality of the victims and on a strategic view of the investigation from the very beginning. The two fundamental contributions of the current transitional justice process are, on the one hand, an investigation model that is based on the selection and prioritization of cases. And on the other, in a victim-centered system for, for which its main purpose is not retribution for the crimes committed, but reparation for the damage caused and the restoration of broken ties with a view to laying the foundations for non-recurrence. This model leaves society international and domestic punitive penal reaction in force, which contemplate the maximum penalties for these crimes judged as the most reprehensible, and instead appeals to a notoriously less drastic restorative retributive modality in the first place, some so-called restorative sanctions, in our language, sanciones propias, that will be imposed on those who, upon being found most responsible for the most serious and representative crimes, acknowledge truth and responsibility before the recognition chamber. 
in the first stage of that dialogical procedure. In this case, the sanction will have a duration of five to eight years and will include effective restrictions of freedoms and rights, not the provision of liberty, and will have reparative and restorative functions of the damage caused. Secondly, the alternative sanctions that will be imposed on those who acknowledge truth and responsibility in the adversarial procedure. These sanctions will have a duration of five to eight years and their function will be essentially retributive because they consist of deprivation of liberty as we traditionally know it. The difference with the restorative sanctions lies in the fact that the recognition of truth and responsibility is given late, which deserves a greater reproach. Finally, the ordinary sanctions that are imposed on those who don't recognize truth or responsibility and are defeated in court. The sanction is prison between 15 and 20 years. The new transitional justice formula is strategic, selective, and subject to prioritization criteria. Indeed, instead of prosecuting all the culprits, all the perpetrators, which would be impossible, it focuses on those most responsible for the most representative crimes. The rest are amnestied or pardoned, or they will receive non-punishment measures, such as the waiver of criminal prosecution, provided that they contribute to the truth and the reparation of the victims. The new solution strengthens the active participation of the victims, called to confront the stories of the alleged perpetrators and to offer their own information and reports. The dialogical method for receiving and confronting stories of victims and perpetrators is indicated as the most appropriate and suitable for maintaining an interaction of this type. The practice of the JEB has been successful in working from the macro case, which can be synthetic, synthetically defined as a large case that groups or accumulates many events that occurred in the armed conflict and that are similar among themselves to identify criminal patterns, concentrate on the most serious and representative crimes and attribute criminal responsibility to those most responsible for these acts. On the other hand, this practice has managed to discard the investigation and prosecution on a case by case basis, and instead has proposed to study an, an identification of crime patterns, that is, a set of behaviors with a common underlying nature, which is not limited to the repetition of, repetition of the same criminal type or to behaviors associated with the commission of the same crime, and that is characterized by responding to a criminal plan or policy. Finally, the most responsible person has been defined as the one who, due to their hierarchical position, rank or leadership, de facto or de jure, of a military, political, economic, or social nature has had a decisive participation in the generation development or execution of macro crime patterns. For instance, domain of the paradigmatic types of crime that occurred in the armed conflict and who regardless of the hierarchical position, rank or leadership participated decisively in the commission of especially serious and representative crimes that defined the pattern of macro crime, the point that his, his utilization would substantially contribute to the goals of the transition to a degree comparable to the prosecution of the architect of the policy. What is the balance of the first four years and what is expected of the new macro cases? The balance of the first years of the special jurisdiction for peace is positive. Many atrocities that Colombia experienced during the conflict have become known thanks to the work of the JEP. With, with its investigations and findings, the jurisdiction has exceeded the threshold of truth reached by ordinary justice and has clarified new portions of truth about some of the most serious and representative events of the war. More than 
13,000 defendants are linked to, to the jurisdiction. They are fully submitted. And more than 325,000 victims of the armed conflict have been accredited or registered. As a specific advances of the investigation through the seven macro cases open, I can mention the following. The JEP has issued the first three accusations of, for international crimes within the macro cases related to the taking of hostages and other serious deprivations of liberty by the FARC and false positives or extrajudicial executions presented as casualties in combat by the state armed forces. Most of the people accused in these two cases, 30 out of 34, acknowledged res responsibility and today, and today really, in the case of extrajudicial executions, the public hearing of acknowledgement is taking place. In, the, in a municipality of Kenya, in this moment, the first military that were charged with different charges, they are recognizing before the victims that they are responsible. And so for today is a very historic day in the history of the JEP and also in the implementation of the peace accord. The judicial proceedings of those who did not acknowledge responsibility in this case have been forwarded to the accusation investigation unit of that JEP. The other five macro cases advanced towards imputations. Three of them investigate crimes committed in some specific territories of, in Colombia and are known as macro territorial cases. These cases involve more than 200,000 victims recognized individually or as part of collective subjects. The other two macro cases investigate crimes committed against more than 5,000 members of a persecuted political party, the Patriotic Union, political party, and the illegal recruitment of more than 18,000 children. In these cases, information has been compiled from reports submitted by victims, ethnic and human rights defenders organizations, as well as from state entities. The related opinion parties have been summoned to voluntary depositions of, to speak about the findings of the investigation and the truth demands of thousands of victims, as well as their observations, which have been received and incorporated to the cases. Regarding the new prioritizations, it is expected basic, basically to cover the serious crimes that occurred in the context of the armed conflict that until now had not been prioritized to have a more complete understanding of the complexity of the armed conflict and to speed up the route to indict the most responsible given the transitory nature of the jurisdiction. The investigation strategy in these macro cases is given by actor or type of victim and not only by criminal conduct as in some of the seven already opened. With this, it is intended to clarify near 300,000 criminal acts of forced disappearance, forced displacement, homicides, massacres, and sexual and gender violence, and thus cover practically the universe of international crimes that occurred in the, in the Colombia armed conflict. What is expected in terms of restoration in the next two years? The acknowledgement of responsibility of those most responsible in, other, in the other macro cases and the imposition of the first sanction with restorative con content are especially expected. In the first place, the space of the JEP allows the victims to narrate their pain, to put it into words, to communicate it, and therefore to turn it into suffering. The task of the defendants is to recognize that pain so that they find themselves in the suffering of the other and they understand that what happened should not have happened. It is expected that dialogical process in several macro cases of the judicial process before the JEP will culminate in the next two years, which will have a very important restorative effect because the pain of the victims is communicated and dignified through the clarification of the truth. 
On the other hand, the imposition of sanctions with a restorative content will imply that those sanctions will begin to carry out works and activities with a restorative content, which are consulted with the victims and which ideally are articulated by the national government. It is expected to see former combatants inserted in these jobs, which may be participation in effective reparation programs for displaced persons, environmental protection and recovery, substitution of illicit crops, literacy and training in school subjects, cleaning and eradication of anti-personal mines or explosive remnants of war, and construction and repair of infrastructure in rural or urban areas such as schools, highways, health centers, homes, community centers, aqueduct, electrification and connectivity networks, among others. In this way, those defendants not only contribute to the repair and restoration of the damage caused by executing the imposed sanction, but also participate in a scenario of inclusion of former combatants so that they are incorporated into the new society resulting from the agreement of peace. Conclusion, peace through the world. Colombia has gone through various models of transitional justice. The current model is one that is based on achieving peace through words, not only because it is the result of a peace negotiation in which it was assumed that the national government was not defeated and that therefore it was necessary to listen to the demobilized armed actor and to its victims. Within the framework of the, of the judicial process, constant dialogue allows progress to be made in achieving peace and the dignity of the victims through recognition. The world becomes in this way the central axis for achieving peace. Therein lies its strength, but also its weakness. The regulatory framework itself is aware of this. For this reason, the first judicial and procedural route or path that, is established, that it established is the one that results around, revolves around the world, the world and the ideological search for truth. If this fails, the second route or track is followed, that of the criminal procedure itself, which can mean sentences of up to 20 years in prison for those found guilty. Given that the root of the criminal process may be due to its delay and demands of all kinds, a reunion with the past of impunity, the effort we are committed to it is that the first route becomes a high speed, efficient and quality highway to stabilize by way of justice, peace. That is the challenge. One final remark. One cloud covers the entire transitional solution. The enormous and insatiable, insatiable demand for justice of the victims cannot be resolved, at least in, in the first place, to the criminal and punitive mechanisms of ordinary criminal justice which have historically produced a high balance of impunity and are incapable of processing until it's in the totality of the claims of justice. That's why the transitional solution was imposed. But this transitional solution cannot be judged considering the parameters of ordinary criminal justice, since it, it entails a new paradigm that is selective and not universal since it focuses on those most responsible and not only on the most serious and representative crimes. On the other hand, this model, as far as the non-adversarial route is concerned, opposes traditional schemes since it is based in the voluntary contribution of truth and acknowledgement of responsibility. The paradox lies in the fact that if the non-adversarial route or path fails, then within the JEP itself, the traditional route of adversarial type criminal proceedings is contemplated and emerges, in which truth and responsibility are not freely recognized, but through an accusatorial criminal justice system, which is more complicated and delayed, in addition to carrying a past of ineffectiveness. It would be paradoxical if the new paradigm were replaced by the classical model of criminal prosecution. 
In any case, the two roots are there and their coexistence could serve so that those responsible for serious crimes end up preferring the contribution of truth to jail, which is the rule of the adversarial regime. So far, in the two most advanced macro cases, the non-adversarial route has been successful. And for this reason, we keep our hope alive that the cloud that covers the transitional solution will gradually disappear and that the truth and restorative justice will succeed. Thank you very much. Eduardo, thank you very much indeed for those extremely compelling reflections on matters of, of, of such huge and moving importance, I think, particularly given the scale of what you've been describing. It's very striking indeed. Uh, now we have a chance for reflections from our two other distinguished panellists, and it's a real pleasure, first of all, to hand over to Martin Flaherty. Martin. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Richard, and uh, thank you to the organizers, Bonnie, here, uh, 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 Claire. Um, it's a real privilege and honor to be here. Um, back in my old stomping grounds of Yale. Uh, in fact, it's here when I was in graduate school that I actually first became interested in Ireland. Um, that resulted in a dissertation that never got written. But uh, several years later, when I was at law school at another institution, I had the uh, opportunity to spend a summer with uh, an NGO in Belfast in the middle of the 80s. In fact, in 1986, the summer, as some of you may recall, that Ulster said no to the Anglo-Irish Agreement uh, with the Committee on the Administration of Justice, uh, one of the leading uh, NGOs in the world uh, then and now, and uh, strictly non-sectarian. And uh, the basis of my right, the metaphor I want to use is that in stark contrast to the very impressive efforts that uh, we just heard about in Colombia, um, justice, both with regard to legacy issues and then in general, has always been something of a poor relation of the peace process. And that it is a poor relation that um, in recent years threatens to be kind of kicked out of the house um, that we should be aware of. Um, and that raises the initial question, well, why? Why uh, are justice issues in ways that I'm about to describe been somewhat marginalized, although not entirely? Um, and I think it has something to do with the top-down nature that Rory was talking about, that um, the paramilitaries were concerned about power constitutional issues and to an extent immunity once there was peace. Um, the same is true of uh, the relevant governments. Um, uh, some of the political parties, especially John Hume's SDLP, were concerned about uh, uh, justice issues and legacy issues more than others. That was in his DNA, but that they weren't the prime drivers of the ultimate settlement. So um, with that as a backdrop, how has that played out? Well, first, with regard to the original uh, uh, Belfast Good Friday Agreement, uh, Justice is a poor relation, but it is a relation. There is a recognition that there is a, a correlation between justice and peace and that justice issues need to be dealt with. And they were dealt with in very interesting ways. One um, that involved constitutional change in both jurisdictions, which was the incorporation of the International uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights which was incorporated into domestic law, both in the United Kingdom and in uh, the Republic of Ireland. That uh, was important, uh, not least because it had been a device that had been used to some effect with regard to the troubles, in part by a lawyer whose case I've been working on since the early 1990s, Patrick Finucane, who brought two cases to Strasbourg uh, involving um, the declaration of emergency by the United Kingdom, uh, which he lost, but also with regard to challenging the uh, interrogation methods being used by the UK. Um, actually, he didn't bring that one. He brought it with regard to um, uh, extended um, uh, periods for detention, and that one he won. So the ICCPR um, had been an important uh, source for uh, 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 at least 
placing some human rights limits even during the troubles. The problem was not having been incorporated, uh, the process for using it uh, demanded exhaustion of domestic remedies, which took quite a while. And so um, it was a signal triumph to have um, that treaty incorporated into the domestic law of both jurisdictions. Um, conversely, when it comes to um, accountability, with regard to um, uh, these issues. Famously, one thing that resulted from the Belfast Good Friday Agreement was a two-year limit on prison sentences for uh, troubles-related offenses. Um, that was arguably a necessary price to pay for the decommissioning of uh, arms and for the participation of the paramilitaries, but it did come at some cost. Um, and it precluded the types of arrangements that uh, we just heard about uh, in Colombia. It still left open, however, uh, um, the issue of how to deal with legacy issues outside of that limitation. And that largely was uh, a can kick down the road. Um, so that's one example in the original agreement of justice issues being a poor relation. Um, since then, the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, Belfast Good Friday Agreement, with regard to justice issues in general and with regard to legacy issues in particular, um, has put more of an emphasis on the poor part of poor relation. Um, one thing that I worked on with CAJ all the way back in 1986 was the prospect of a specific Bill of Rights for um, Northern Ireland over and above what would, is provided in the ICCPR. Um, there was a commitment to um, uh, institute a Bill of Rights uh, uh, in Northern Ireland, but for various reasons, um, uh, which I'll leave to the Q&A, um, that was sidetracked and remains sidetracked. And in fact, today remains, I think, something of a non-starter. With regard to legacy, there was hope. And in fact, there was a high point in this process with a kind of follow-up um, with regard to uh, legacy issues and other related issues, a sort of follow-up or an attempted follow-up to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which was the Stormont House Agreement of 2014. Um, and that involved uh, both governments, but also uh, great input from civil society um, with regard to legacy issues. And it established a number of mechanisms to at least get the information out, in particular, a historical investigation unit on an independent body, independent from the police service of Northern Ireland, which would attempt to get at the truth for the catharsis of that coming out and for uh, as a basis for putting the past behind and uh, further reconciliation. However, um, not to put too fine a point on it, but that agreement has been basically shelved um, and was shelved really as recently as about a year and a half ago, thanks to the current uh, government of uh, Boris Johnson. Which leads me to my third point. And my third point uh, uh, gets to the image of the poor relation um, being shown the door. Um, and how is that happening? Well, in a couple of ways. First, with regard to legacy issues, um, uh, just about a year ago, the Johnson government put out a uh, study paper that proposes basically um, a statute of limitations, which is effectively an amnesty for any and all offenses that occurred during the troubles. And what is, and from a human rights point of view, it's egregious from a number of levels. It's a clear violation of Article Two of the ICCPR. It places uh, the United Kingdom on the wrong side of uh, uh, what Chile proposed in terms of legacy issues. Um, but it, um, it, it the, the worst part about it is, it was, this proposal um, was made without any consultation of any of the parties or any members of civil society in Northern Ireland. It's a rare thing in Northern Ireland, then and now, to get all the political parties to agree on anything, including Sinn Féin on the one hand and the DUP on the other. They agreed that this proposed amnesty is uh, and should be a non-starter. 
now, uh, I've been part of a group that's met repeatedly with Brandon Lewis, who is the uh, current Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. We are being assured that there is consultation going on and that the uh, ultimate proposal will look significantly different from the initial proposal. Based on previous dealings in this uh, area, I have my doubts. So this is something that people should uh, keep an eye on. Um, but finally, and what I think is even more troubling in certain ways, is the prospect um, of basically unincorporating the ICCPR pursuant to the uh, Belfast Good Friday Agreement in the guise of proposing a new British Bill of Rights. This British Bill of Rights would be seen as um, uh, relating to distinctively British matters, although the one thing that the government seems to be pointing on uh, to the greatest extent is they want it to be easier to deport people, and the ICCPR currently makes that too hard. So that seems to be one of the great impetuses for this um, uh, proposal. But what this proposal will do will be, again, to make it um, very time consuming for anyone to go to Strasbourg. And indeed, there are proposals by some uh, elements of the government to uh, um, uh, uh, exit from the ICCPR itself, as uh, just recently uh, uh, Vladimir Putin has announced. Um, related to that, and finally, is this proposed new UK Bill of Rights, not only, um, by un not only would it unincorporate the ICCPR, but it is also being proffered as a substitute for the distinctive Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, which has yet to be delivered. And so this is another development um, to keep your eye on, because uh, I know we're getting to implementation this afternoon, but as I'm sure the point will be this afternoon, the peace process in any location, especially in locations as difficult as the ones that we're talking about, is not something that ends with the signing of pieces of paper. It is an ongoing process and uh, it can go in the wrong direction as easily as it can go in the right direction. Thank you. Martin, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Elizabeth Wood. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to share the stage with Magistrado Cifuentes uh, uh, as leader of the HEP, uh, as well as the other panelists. Uh, it's just a, a profound pleasure. And thank you for the invitation to comment on this theme of peace and justice. Let me begin with the US Civil War a profoundly devastating war in which at least 600,000 soldiers died. The most recent estimate is three quarters of a million soldiers. That's not including civilians. It left in its wake important changes, especially in the US South. The war emancipated enslaved people and forged changes in the wealth, labor and social relations generally in the South. African Americans were recognized as citizens, as rights bearing and equal before the law, recognized as such de jure, to be sure, not de facto. There was little transfer of property during the immediate post war period, the Reconstruction. Nonetheless, the plantation declined as landlords began renting small holdings to former enslaved people, often under sharecropping agreements. But about a decade later, a political pact between elites of the North and the South halted the tenuous progress in the South. Violence against African-Americans, including lynching, continued and legislation designed to restrict their exercise of rights undercut any realization of social justice, equality before the law and equality of opportunity. As a result, economic, political and social inequality endured in the rural South for more than a century and continues to some extent today, despite the significant progress forged by the civil rights movement. So this history suggests some very sobering lessons. I'm not sure what number of lessons we're on now, <laughs> uh, but uh, sobering indeed. While civil wars and their end may change agrarian structures and social relations in profound ways, 
that may promise a refounding of the state towards a more just society, despite the suffering endured, a failure to build on this potential can lead to sustained indeed deepened injustice and in some settings, a return to conflict, perhaps short of civil war. Now, as we have heard, the 2016 Peace Accord put in place commitments, institutions, and processes towards a durable peace, most notably the HEP and the Truth Commission, both of which have developed innovative policies and practices towards diverse forms of accountability and reparations for harm inflicted on civilians during the war. The HEP is a dialogic process, a new paradigm, a non-adversarial route to the truth and restorative justice, as Magistrado Cifuentes has just explained. Among achievements most important, I think, is the recognition of the specific harm suffered by particular communities, including indigenous and Afro-descendant communities, women, and gender and sexual minorities. I was honored, honored to have attended the first hearing of victims held by the Truth Commission, and the commission chose to hold a hearing with, for victims of sexual violence, an incredibly moving experience. However, let's recall the sobering lessons from the US, that the window for changes to address enduring injustices may slam shut if the state fails to effectively implement newly recognized rights and to redress longstanding injustice in the countryside. So the lack of progress on points of the accord that concern agrarian social relations is deeply troubling. Now we'll hear a lot more about implementation this afternoon from the special representative, Carlos Ruiz. But according to the Kroc Institute, mandated to assess implementation of the accords, about 30% of the general stipulations of the accord have been completed at the end of 2021. However, only 4% of the first point, the agrarian point have been completed and only 21% of the point on illicit crops. Only 12 and 13% of the stipulations concerning gender and ethnic communities respectively have been completed. Now, counting the status of stipulations is a very crude way to measure the progress of implementation. And again, we'll hear a lot more about that this afternoon. But the human costs of lagging implementation are evident in the ongoing assassinations of leaders for land restitution of Afro-descendant and indigenous communities and defenders of human rights. According to Indepas, between January 1st and April 24th of this year, 59 social leaders and defenders of human rights have been assassinated, of which 14 were indigenous and two Afro-descendant. Almost 150,000 people were displaced in 2021. A research assistant in Colombia sends around a daily summary of news, major news outlets in Colombia. Let me just give you a few in today's bulletin. I'm happy to add anybody to our list if you like. A former FARC combatant was assassinated in Cauca. He was a member of the local promotion, Center for the Promotion of Territorial Development. In Nariño, the mayor of El Charco was kidnapped, joining some 45 others currently held. On the other hand, nine victims, kidnapping victims in Chaco were released, including three children. Over the weekend, nine people were killed in Valle de Cauca and four more in Putumayo. So while the HEP and the Truth Commission are developing remarkable innovations towards accountability, renewed violence is occurring at a disturbing rate, dimming the prospects for durable peace founded on justice and accountability. Thank you. Elizabeth, thank you very much indeed. We've had excellent and wide ranging reflections from all three of our speakers. It's given us much to think about and now we're gonna to move to the questions and discussion phase. Um, so who will start us off with the question? We'll question over there on the left, start, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you all for being here. Um, I have something specific for special words. Um, I'm gonna start with the question of which is a new phrase, and I'm not sure how you 
arrived at that because it's a very divisive phrase here in the US because it parses um, Black Americans who are comfortable with being called Black, having nothing to do with their nationality with people born in Africa, people born in the Caribbean. And the only time I really heard African Americans was Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition. So it seems that Black Americans are still fighting for the three fifths um, things that happen to be recognized as Americans. And I'm seeing more and more in uh, higher up circles and paper circles where this information is being disseminated using African Americans, which will go out. I'm not sure where it should be decided or when it should be decided to use African Americans. If I can do that, if I can do the Caribbean, I volunteer in a lot of places. A lot of students at Yale are actually, if you look at them, that's what, excuse me, if you look at the numbers, they are not Black Americans. They're speaking to an audience of people, Black people, from other places. And you are now excluding us. Why should I help you? That's what I'm getting from these different talks. And people monetize African Americans. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a number of questions and then give the panel a chance. Um, Rory? Yes, thank you very much, Dean. Fascinating um, presentations by, by all three, and can't agree more with, uh, than with Martin Flaherty about the extraordinary paradox which would be involved in the British government um, residing from the European Convention on Human Rights, which, which was so instrumental in, of course, drawing up. A question for Eduardo, though. Um, fascinated um, to, to hear about the, uh, you know, the really in an Irish context, almost unthinkable um, concepts um, which you are, 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 are implementing. But the question, first of all, uh, two of the big problems in, in Ireland, I think, uh, are first of all, that different communities focus on different victims and different perpetrators. Um, and there's always this constant question of, you know, is there too much of a focus on this group of perpetrators or, 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 or on others? And secondly, I think a strong sense that the, the foot soldiers, if you like, are the ones in the, in the spotlight and that the leaders, whether political, um, political parties or paramilitary organizations or governments, uh, you know, have got away as got free, as you, might, as you might say. But to what extent is there a widespread practical acceptance uh, in, in Colombia that your exercise, that your, your, your initiatives are, are balanced uh, in terms of their scope and in terms of their implementation. Um, and, you know, in other words, is, and is there a, a sense that you are being um, fair when it comes to the selection of macro cases and leading personalities? Thanks, Rory. I'm going to take a question from Melissa Lane and then from Sergio Jaramillo, and then we're going to give the panel a chance to respond. Melissa. Hi, thank you. Um, perhaps Richard or Martin might respond to this. I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit more about changing demographics in Northern Ireland. And um, I understand that the results from, I believe, the 2021 census will be released, I think, in June. Um, and if there's anything um, perhaps that might be expected from that, and, and as Martin was talking about the Bill of Rights, um, I can see that that being tied into all of this and kind of the need that for rights to be protected um, as demographics are, are shifting, perhaps. Thank you very much. And then Sergio. Yes, I, 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 I had actually a comment, and um, as I'm not in an official, official position, I want to take uh, the liberty of being less, slightly less dip uh, diplomatic than Eduardo in the following sense, which is, and actually I want to start by saying that we Colombians have a, a huge debt of gratitude to the British government, we, we extremely supportive of the peace process in every sense, including and crucially at the Security Council. Um, now, that said, I, I mean, when I first heard the story of the statute of limitations and what's going on in Northern Ireland, I just couldn't believe it. And <laughs> I thought, I mean, if ever there was a case of double standards in the world, this must be it. So if in Colombia we had suggested anything remote like this, we would basically would have been hammered into some kind of hole somewhere uh, by the whole international community. 
and Colombia is making absolutely massive efforts, massive efforts. I mean, you don't, you have to think that the HEP is, is a very large tribunal. It consumes very large amount of resources comparable to the International Tribunal of Yugoslavia. And this is in Colombia. We could be using those resources for something else, but such is the commitment to address these violations and to come up with the truth that this is what we're doing. And we had, I didn't mention that, we had the prosecutor of the ICC in Colombia in, in November signing an agreement with the government, which actually took Colombia out of preliminary examination, which meant that the ICC considered that Colombia with its system was in compliance with the Rome Statute, which is a very big triumph for uh, such processes. And at the same time, you have the British government putting on the table uh, what I think some commentators in Belfast have called, called Amnesty Pinochet Plus, sort of the most extensive amnesty that anybody has ever seen. And if you actually go a little bit back, uh, I'm not an expert, but I've actually looked at the Stormont House Agreement and, you know, it's good, but it's not great. I mean, it's not, it's not there's no effort there. And it's, it's a great pity that Pablo de Grave couldn't be with us today because Pablo as as Colombian, but as, as, as the first special rapporteur on transitional justice, went to Northern Ireland in late 15 and actually pointed out that this effort didn't really try and comprehensively look at what happened. Um, I actually took, made, made the effort of looking at the Stormont House Agreement. You, you actually don't find the word truth in it. The concept of truth is not in the agreement. It's all information gathering, collecting, uh, submitting cases for the idea. So we, and this actually, I go back to the Colombian government, President Santos took the very tough decision to say, we're also accountable and we will face what happened. And I think this is the main reason why that things have not worked in Northern Ireland, because I don't think that this position is there from the British government. Thank you, Sergio. Double standards in the Boris Johnson government. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, there'll be questions directed to all three of our panelists. We're going to start by going to Elizabeth, and then Martin, and then Eduardo. So, Elizabeth, the first question is to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your question. I use the term African American in this context because I'm talking about the rural South, and I want to emphasize that they were citizens. They were Americans, and they were still suffering the kind of violence, discrimination, exclusion, and so on. To be sure, when I teach my course on social movements and community organizing, I use the term black. <laughs> Martin. So I guess uh, one word on demographics and then uh, something on amnesty. So, um, and, um, uh, some of the other uh, participants may be more up on the numbers. My understanding is that the uh, you know, Catholic population will overtake the Protestant population in Northern Ireland, you know, in a matter of years that had, had been a prediction of 2022. I don't know if that's happened yet, but, you know, it will happen in part because since there is peace, there's a lot less out migration from the Catholic uh, community, from the nationalist community. Um, um, the other thing about demographics in Northern Ireland is, um, uh, oh, and just so what are the consequences of that? Well, one, we'll probably see May 5th because there are elections for the uh, uh, Northern Ireland Assembly. And uh, according to poll numbers, it looks like uh, Sinn Féin will have at least the plurality for the first time and will outpoll um, the DUP, which would make uh, Michelle O'Neill the first uh, uh, minister. Um, and then we'll see whether the DU DUP wants to participate or not. It could uh, create another uh, political crisis. And interestingly, um, uh, based on poll numbers in the Republic, it may be that Sinn Féin will produce the next Taoiseach. Mary Lou McDonald. So we might have the extraordinary situation where you have North and South, the leaders being from Sinn Féin and both women. Um, we'll see how that goes. The other thing um, that is, is actually implicating a colleague of, uh, of uh, Richard's is um, the issue of referendum. Because under the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, at some point when it uh, looks like um, there is uh, a fair chance for um, uh, a vote for United Ireland, then that vote should be called. 
who has the remit to call the vote, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. And one thing that was left ambiguous in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement was exactly when that should happen, how it should take place, et cetera. And already there are discussions um, in Northern Ireland, one led by one of Richard's colleagues, Colin Harvey, about what a United Ireland might look like. And he has been subjected to quite a lot of abuse on social media and in the press, et cetera. <clears throat> so um, with regard to um, the other thing with regard to demographics is um, Northern Ireland is also becoming more diverse. So there, even when I was there, there was already an East Asian population. I think there were more Polish recruits to the police service of Northern Ireland, you know, than so, and that's another reason, an argument for a distinctive Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, because one thing that the ICCPR doesn't really address are issues of identity, which are big for both the nationalist and um, uh, uh, unionist communities, but also for these new communities that are there and their distinctive position. Um, just quickly with regard to the amnesty, one point I should have made is it's, uh, it is not just a statute of limitation for criminal prosecutions. The scope is breathtaking. It is a proposal that there be no civil actions, no inquests, no independent inquiries of any sort for political violence during the troubles. Um, we'll see whether that gets scaled down um, and why. Um, what, uh, Conventionally, uh, uh, two reasons are on offer. The more immediate one is a concern for soldiers being put on trial and so placating the kind of veterans lobby in England. Um, but the other thing I put, uh, I put there is the way that the British government fought the uh, troubles was, you know, analogous to the dirty war in Argentina. There were so many informers who had their, so many hands dirty, this also involves the Finucane case, that um, uh, having inquests is not something that any British government wants, but in particular this one, so. Thank you, Martin. Eduardo. <clears throat> Thank you for, for the very important question because we, we need to explain better uh, what is the aim of, of of the jeb the main of the jeb maybe is divisive in society in post-conflict society because it is based on the selection and prioritization of cases i think that there is no alternative because the final goal is not to study to investigate to treat to sanction all culprits all perpetrators in a 50 year old internal conflict, it's quite impossible really. And uh, moreover, the, the term of, of the JEB is limited in time. The, the Chamber of Recognition of Facts and Conducts <coughs> is just 10 years term. So in 10, 10 years term, it has to, to, to look for what are the cases, the most representative and who maybe are the culprits the most responsible. And so for that reason, it has to use this very strange figure of macro case. A macro case is uh, just uh, a category that, uh, that means that the, the, the tribunal has to combine all facts that have certain similarities, that can have certain uh, impacts in certain territories and also populations and groups. And so try finally to systemize all information, all versions, all what has been done before by the ordinary justice and try to formalize charges and imputations to the responsible uh, individuals that are considered the most responsible. Now, the, the, the recipe for, for Colombia, uh, uh, for the JEB, has for that reason many, many ingredients that are difficult to, to, to solve and to have a final and equitable solution. We have more than 8 million victims. We have more than 300,000 uh, <coughs> criminal acts. And we have also, as responsible of those crimes, thousands of former guerrilla, guerrilla combatants. We have military and we have civilians 
third parties that participated in the conflict. So we need to organize that panorama and we, for that reason, we have chose this macro case as the unit of work for, for the JEP. Now, after and in the process of prioritization, victims are already consulted. And after that, the decision, the decision is taken by this first chamber of justice, the, the chamber of recognition. Uh, what does the HEP do with all this work? First, we put in action the first track, the first path that is a path in which these culprits or, or perpetrators are initially called in order to render their explanations and also to give them the possibility to recognize the facts and also to recognize responsibility. The duty is to, to give all the truth, they can give this truth. But this truth is confronted also with the narratives, with the reports and with the participation of the victims that is the centerpiece of all this system. This is the first time in history that we are going to apply restorative justice, not just in juvenile ca cases, like in family cases, but in cases that are related with war crimes and crimes against humanity. And we do this through a different method. It's not the application of the classic penal or procedural codes, but instead of that, we have to appeal to a dialogue, a very difficult dialogue between whom? Between the victims on one side and the perpetrators on the other side. Judges that normally don't have this judicial new culture has to tr has, have really a very difficult role trying to approximate vi visions and views and also to develop this, this dialogue to a final point in which Finally, perpetrators recognize the responsibility and victims become satisfied. As I said before, today in this municipality of Ocaña, the first indicted military are recognizing responsibility in front of the victims. And they are going to be judged and sanctioned for more than 6,000 false positives or extrajudicial executions of people. So it was not easy for the victims to accept this, this audience, this public hearing with the culprits. And what is in the base? What is the underlying unit for this method of dialogue? The macro case. Macro case also means macro victimization. Macro case means to accumulate thousands of data, informs, reports, testimony of the last 50 years. In a macro case, in a macro case that is not a case by case methodology, we have also to handle thousands of victims. So it's not easy in terms of administration of justice. Is there, is there a sense in society though that your net is, is catching a sufficient range of types of we're going to have to take that yes, question with the other. We've just got time for Fergal, Mythe, and, and Jonathan Powell, and then the subsidiary question from Rory, and then we'll have to bring the panel to an end once the speakers have had a chance to answer those questions. But Fergal, first. Thanks very much, Richard. Just a few a few comments, seeing as I'm, I'm working currently in this field. Um, firstly, it's, it's great to hear Mark in reference to CAJ, the Committee on Administration of Justice, did huge work in Northern Ireland on non party political, non sectarian basis. and. Uh, we, we had a great and have a great relationship with them. I mean, on the human rights front, I mean, the Good Friday Agreement is built on a foundation of human rights and equality. You had the, the commitment to incorporate the ECHR into uh, UK law. We had the establishment of the Human Rights Commission for Northern Ireland, the Equality Commission, and it's really, really hardwired in there and it's essential. Um, the Irish government, and it's a matter of record, we have concerns about the UK proposals around, around uh, the, the Human Rights Bill uh, for that reason, because the ECHR is such an integral part of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, and we'll continue to raise those concerns. Legacy, legacy is really challenging in Northern Ireland, and, and we've, we've struggled to, to you know, we, we look at other peace processes around the world, which have been able in some ways to grapple with it in a way that Northern Irish society just hasn't been able to. And, and 
we've asked that question and, and it may be that Northern Ireland society is actually, it's a very small place. Uh, people live cheek by jowl in Enniskillen or Belfast. People may suspect who did what to their loved ones. It's very raw and it, 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 it's a very small community in many, many ways. Uh, but Rory was absolutely right. You know, victims and legacy got a few warm words in the Good Friday Agreement, but nothing more in terms of, of mechanisms or processes. Um, the first real process was the Eames Bradley process in 2009, which was a very, very strong civil society uh, attempt to, to uh, find a way through on legacy. Uh, it failed, it fell at the first hurdle. The Stormont House Agreement, it's not pretty, Sergio, uh, like many <laughs> agreements in Northern Ireland, um, and uh, Eamon Gilmore, was very heavily involved in that process, but it had the value of, of being the two governments and the political parties yes. being involved mm -hmm. in shaping an agreement. Um, and yes, it's, it, it's, it's suboptimal, but that was its strength uh, and we still abide by it, and we still support and still call for the implementation of the Stormont House Agreement. The Irish government, again, as a matter of record, has raised very, very strongly its concerns around the British government proposals. That's a matter of, of public record, both our Prime Minister and our Minister for Foreign Affairs. We have, um, in that, we share the views of, of the parties in Northern Ireland and, and civic society. So we have secured a commitment to a consultation process, which has taken place over the past year. But as of now, we're not sure where these proposals are. Um, but again, you know, the path forward in Northern Ireland has always been agreements shaped by the two governments with political buy-in from political parties. That's the model that has worked, and that's the model we, we, we truly believe in, even if on occasion it doesn't produce beautiful babies, uh, as the Stormont House Agreement is. But it's a very, very challenging issue for Northern Ireland. We really, and, and I mean, you know this, Richard, it's probably the one area that we haven't really been able to grapple with in, in the peace process in a successful way. Thank you, Virgil. Jonathan Powell. Thanks. Um, this may be too complicated a question to answer at the time well, with this panel, but maybe we could come back to it in the last panel. At the beginning, we talked about uh, drawing lessons from Northern Ireland and from Colombia that would be useful for other negotiations happening at the moment. And the interesting thing, both in Colombia and in Northern Ireland, is the balance between peace and justice trying to get justice, but not absolute justice, because if you did that, you wouldn't get your peace. If you went to the FARC leadership at the beginning of the negotiation and said, you're going to jail for 30 years, they wouldn't engage in the peace process. So Colombia came to a very difficult and complicated balance through the Jet Hep and the um, uh, and Truth and Reconciliation process. In Northern Ireland, we failed to, the circle described, failed to do that. If you were looking at negotiations in Ukraine and negotiations in Ethiopia, terrible things, terrible war crimes have been committed. And yet we want there to be peace negotiations to end the conflict in Ukraine. We want there to be peace negotiations to end the conflict in Ethiopia. How would you apply the lessons you've learned from Colombia with the HEP and the Truth and Reconciliation process and the failure in Northern Ireland to address the issue of the past? How would you address it? In these two conflicts, what would the lessons be that we would share with those leaders addressing this? Would you say to Ukrainians, you have to insist on Putin turning up at the Hague or there's no agreement? Or would you say, okay, we'll let that pass? I, I just, I, there is no absolutism. I, I don't, that's just, we don't try and address that now. Maybe we come back to it last time. Um, it's a really, really major question, Jonathan. I think it goes to the heart of this, this whole event. So what I'd like to do, if, if people are okay with this, is give each of the panelists a chance to respond um, to the points that, that Fergal has raised, that Jonathan has raised, and the follow-up from Rory. So brief comments from each of you, and then we'll have to bring the session to an end, unfortunately. But Eduardo. In a certain way, mm may have uh, some precedent in the case of Colombia, because we have war crimes, crimes against humanity, and also the obligation of, of the state, member of the ICC treaty, treat, Brown Treaty, in order to investigate and to sanction all these crimes with no possibility, because otherwise could be a breach of, of, of the international obligations. So in the first meeting I, I sustained with Mr. Khan from the ICC was the one related with how does Colombia fulfill the treaty obligations 
that emerged from the Statue of Rome, applying these two procedures of justice, being the first one, just uh, a dialogical way of arriving to a conclusion among victims and perpetrators, and that can be translated only in very soft sanctions because the, the restorative sanctions uh, imply just restriction, some restrictions of freedom, but it doesn't mean incarceration. So the same will happen with Ukraine in, in, in the world of the ICC, because uh, these crimes have to be uh, sanctioned with the most proportional sanctions, and these sanctions maybe are not the sub sanctions of a, of a non retributive system that is retributive only partially because it means a restriction of liberty, but the, the, the accent is put in those restorative measures, works and activities that the perpetrators have to be, uh, have to, to work for, for the victims. So, but finally, the Mr. Khan accepted, even though he's a criminalist, he's a very classic, he has a very classical approach to international crime that in certain conflicts in this internal conflict of Colombia, the two responses were necessary. The first way was to give the opportunity to culprits to recognize responsibility. If they don't do so, they can, if this phase fails, so we pass to, to the classical one, to the adversarial mechanisms of application of justice. And I think that maybe this could be a formula because finally, Mr. Khan accepted and he finally signed an agreement with President Duque, accepting this type of justice after ICC was approved. That means that it is not necessary to go initially to the criminal procedure that finalizes in incarceration without giving an opportunity first to the victims and to the perpetrators to have an accord in terms of restorative justice on their, the base of giving full truth and assume full responsibility. So I think that maybe the practice of Colombia will be important because you, you, you have a soft solution uh, that is fund, that is supported in the admission of responsibility and the contribution to truth. And afterwards, you can go through the criminal process in which the hard sanctions can be applied. Maybe this is a good lesson for the future. In other words, an internal, an internal armed conflict solution may, be, may serve to an international conflict. Thank you, Eduardo. Martin and Elizabeth. Martin? Yes, and uh, so to just quickly respond to Virgil's um, remarks. Um, so yeah, in fact, I agree. I, I didn't mean, uh, and I hope my remarks aren't taken to minimize the importance of uh, uh, peace and justice in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in particular. I think that was when the relation was uh, uh, at the table more than at any other period. And in part, that's because one point I didn't make that you know, a lot of the focus goes to governments, a lot of the focus goes to the diaspora, a lot of the, but there is a very rich, robust, incredibly active civil society in Northern Ireland on a range of issues, not just women's rights, LGBTQ rights, you know, um, prisoners rights, people like Monica McWilliams, Martin O'Brien, any number of uh, professors in the law faculty of Queens, you know, and, and I think it's in part on that basis, that slice of the sandwich that helped make sure that uh, uh, equality and justice were at the table, uh, especially at that point. Um, Fergal was also too kind to correct me. Um, please do a find and replace. I misspoke throughout. You got it too. I didn't, when I said ICCPR, I meant ECHR, the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, I've been doing stuff on uh, Hong Kong lately, so I've been thinking of the ICCPR. So thank you for uh, being too kind to correct me, but I'm correcting myself on that one. Um, and then one final thing, I'm just gonna raise something entirely new and just throw it out there because this is uh, something that I unwittingly uh, confronted 
the uh, Cahill Daly, the uh, Catholic Archbishop of Armagh on. And this gets to Sergio's point about sometimes that real outsider's perspective. I think <clears throat> one of the ongoing structural threats to ongoing peace in Northern Ireland, one thing that makes it fragile is the prospect of state supported religious education. The idea that people in Northern Ireland still go to primary and secondary schools based on their religion. And that that is, that's not private, that's supported by the state. And that is just embedding division into a community. And I think until that is tackled in some way, shape or form, the peace is always going to be fragile in a society where people only mix on a superficial level unless and until a small minority gets to university. Thank you, Martin. Elizabeth, some final thoughts from you? Yeah, just to uh, close um, and building on, on your last remark, I think to think about the relationship between peace and justice, we need to widen the optic, which is in the Colombian case, means taking that first point of the peace accords very seriously. I was very encouraged by what you said about the candidates uh, in the election. Do they really all endorse sincerely? Will they all put resources into implementing the first point? That would be astounding. I just hope the window has not already slammed shut. So, you know, there's a trade-off between the long run and the short run uh, uh, imperatives uh, to put in place a durable peace. And uh, uh, there's many different aspects of this, but in Colombia, the countryside, the periphery, your vision of a territorial peace was so crucial to that hopefulness after 2016. So uh, I look forward to hearing more about the, an analysis of the implementation this afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. We've had a wonderful session. Brilliant presentations from our speakers. Great questions and discussion. So in closing, please join me in thanking Eduardo Sifuentes, Martin Fahaji, and Elizabeth Wood.